Our first panel discussion is about measurement, a very exciting idea, measurement. Um, but it turns out to be quite important. Uh, think about when we go to work, um, we get it in the office. We get that what's measured gets done. What's measured gets done. Um, but what if we measure the wrong thing? Then we know the wrong thing is getting done. And the other risk with measurement is that um, uh, if we don't measure whether regulations are indeed expanding economic opportunity, instead regulations are facilitating uh, crony capitalism, if we don't measure whether regulations are expanding eco economic opportunity, we also face that kind of policy risk. And that's going to be the focus of, of this panel. How do we get the good of measurement and set aside the bad? Um, my Mercatus colleague, Stefan Miller, will be uh, moderating this panel. Um, Stefan is a financial market scholar at the Mercatus Center. He's taught graduate and undergraduate courses in economics at Bryn Mawr College and served various roles as an economist in both Australia and the World Bank. With that, let me uh, uh, introduce Stefan, and he will in turn introduce our panelists. Thanks, Dino. So uh, let me introduce our panel of distinguished uh, guests. So we have Sharon Brown Ruska from Tulane University and the National Economic Research Associates. We have John Coates from Harvard Law School. We also have Jerry Ellig and Hester Peirce from the Mercatus Center. So before we go on to our Q&A session, I'd like to sort of give you the rules for the session. Uh, after we do the Q&A, you'll have an opportunity to, as Dino mentioned earlier, ask a questions of our panelists. You'll see there are two standing mics, one on the left, one on the right. So please line up and I will alternate between the mics on the left and the right to give people a fair chance. And please be brief when you ask your question, that way we can get to as many as possible. So now for the benefit of people on the panel, I'd like to start off by asking people in the audience, uh, please raise your hand if in your workplace you currently use either regulatory impact analysis, economic analysis, or cost-benefit analysis? OK, some people. Now, if you don't, and, or if you didn't raise your hand, uh, could you please raise your hand if you are at least familiar with the concepts of the, any one of those three? OK, great. So now let me start by turning it over to Jerry. And I'll, I'll ask you, could you, for the for our benefit, explain to us how you distinguish between uh, regulatory impact analysis, economic analysis, and cost-benefit analysis. OK, sure. And actually, I'm going to go for extra credit by not using any acronyms either. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a little bit of confusion about the terms. And, and part of it, I think, is because there is a caricature of benefit-cost analysis. Uh, that, that I want to, you know, kind of mention and then dispel. And, and the caricature is this, that benefit-cost analysis means you're considering a regulation, uh, you count up all the possible benefits and convert them to monetary terms, you count up all the possible costs and convert them to monetary terms, and then if the benefits exceed the costs in monetary terms, you, you adopt the regulation, and if the benefits don't exceed the costs, you don't adopt the regulation. Now, that caricature is misleading for a couple of reasons. One is because it presumes that the sole purpose of benefit-cost analysis is to count up the benefits and the costs of one course of action that you're considering, rather than compare alternative courses of action to see which one might be best. The other th reason that caricature is misleading is because it confuses an ought with an is. That is. It confuses the analysis with the decision. Benefit-cost analysis is information that can inform decisions. It's not the decision. And if, as a decision maker, a regulator, a member of Congress, or anybody else uh, decides that my decision rule will be, I will regulate if the monetized benefits exceed the monetized costs, otherwise I won't, that involves an additional value judgment, which is that comparing monetized benefits and costs is the right way to figure out what's best for society. All right, but that's different from simply doing, hopefully, an objective analysis 
that gives us an idea of what the benefits are, what the costs are of alternative courses of action. Now, people who are knowledgeable about benefit-cost analysis will probably say, oh, well, wait a minute. Yeah, benefit-cost analysis, of course, is supposed to consider alternatives. And in order to develop alternatives, you have to understand the nature of the uh, system-wide problem that you're trying to solve. What's the market failure, or what's the government failure, or what's the other big, hairy problem, and what caused it? Uh, but, but sometimes folks you know, just think in terms of counting stuff rather than understanding what caused the problem and then what are the alternative solutions. Now, regulatory impact analysis is a term of art that refers to the analysis executive branch agencies are supposed to conduct when they issue significant regulations. Uh, what does significant mean? Well, really it means whatever the Office of Management and Budget says is significant is significant. I mean, that's what the executive order <laughs> that, that defines this says. But a regulatory impact analysis, at least a good one, should have four key elements, which is identifying and analyzing the problem the agency's trying to solve, developing alternatives, and then assessing the benefits and the costs of the alternatives. Now, that term originally came from uh, one of the early executive orders that told executive branch agencies they're supposed to do this. Some folks don't like to use the term regulatory impact analysis to refer to what, what uh, independent agencies do because the independent agencies aren't under the executive order. Uh, and so then they'll use the term economic analysis as kind of a synonym for regulatory impact analysis. So, you, you know, you can pick your term. Um, if I personally think that benefit cost analysis or cost benefit analysis, because of the caricature, is a little confusing and makes people think that the analysis is uh, a lot less extensive than it's really supposed to be. Um, I'm quite happy with the term regulatory impact analysis because it describes uh, what it is that uh, agencies are supposed to do. Uh, and, but on the other hand, if you don't like the term regulatory impact analysis because it implies some uh, you know, requirements that are in executive orders that aren't applied to independent agencies, if you want to use economic analysis as a synonym for that, um, that probably works. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, now, just to make things simple, for here on out, from here on out, I'll just use the word economic analysis, and I'd like to now ask Hester, uh, can you tell us how people use economic analysis when it comes to formulating rules and, and in the regulatory process? Sure, um, and I prefer the term economic analysis because as a lawyer, that means the economists have to do it, and I don't, so <laughs> it works for me. But um, at the financial regulators are all independent regulatory agencies. And as Jerry mentioned, they're not subject to those executive orders to perform economic analysis. So they're not doing economic analysis by and large. Now, there are some requirements uh, that apply to all agencies, the Administrative Procedure Act, the Paperwork Reduction Act, the Reg Flex uh, requirements to look at effects on small businesses. So there's some sort of cross-cutting obligations that all agencies have to comply with, but often those are very much check-the-box analyses. Now, some of the financial regulators also in their organic statutes have specific requirements for them. So the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is the one that most people think of with this. Um, they have to think of competition, capital formation, and efficiency when they're writing some of their rules. And that has been interpreted to be a cost-benefit analysis requirement. And in fact, when it was put in there, that was what, that, that appears to be what was, was behind including that in the statute. And so with that obligation, uh, they've sort of not taken it very seriously over the years. Uh, lawsuits have made them take it more seriously recently. Uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission also has an organic statute that requires them to look at costs and benefits in light of certain considerations. I actually think their language is stronger than the SEC's language, uh, but they have not taken it very seriously at all, and they've focused a lot of attention on the fact that they have to consider costs and benefits, which means they can consider them and ignore them, um, and that's what they've tended to do. The new Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection also has an obligation to look at costs and benefits, and so, uh, again, they have, have not really embraced that obligation, but hope springs eternal. Um, there are other agencies that have, have 
put on themselves their own requirements to do economic analysis. So, for example, the Federal Reserve in 1979 adopted a policy statement that said, we're going to look at costs and benefits, and we're going to be open and transparent. We're going to let other people see our work and comment on it. Uh, now, that was 1979. It was a long time ago, and they've stopped worrying about that, although they still claim to follow it. They don't actually follow it. But then you have some of the quasi-governmental regulatory organizations, which interestingly are setting a little bit of a gold standard of late. Uh, so I would argue that these entities, such as FINRA and the MSRB, are obligated to do an analysis in order to satisfy the SEC's obligation, because the SEC has to look at the rules that they adopt and approve them. But in any event, that hasn't been the case. And so Lately, there's been pressure for them to start doing economic analysis, and so both FINRA and MSRB have brought on, um, have taken on the, the, the obligation to do economic analysis, and they're both trying to approach it from different ways. FINRA has hired a chief economist, and MSRB has started doing economic analysis in their rules. So we'll see if this sets a, a broader trend among financial regulators. Okay. Thanks, Hester. Uh, now, uh, Sharon. You were at the CFTC for some time. Can you explain how people used economic analysis, and did you feel that it was successful overall? Well, it, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, 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 I think, as, as Hester mentioned, the CFTC statute says that the CFTC must consider the cost and benefits uh, in their rulemaking and in their interpretations. Um, uh, they have... Um, uh, uh, when I was there, we uh, certainly, uh, you know, considered that to imply that um, the economists would be uh, involved in all facets of the rulemakings. Um, and uh, prior to my, uh, I guess, prior to my arrival, uh, uh, the uh, organ, the CFTC was reorganized, and um, they had uh, prior, you know. When I was there, say, in the 90s, the CFTC had a chief economist's office, a whole division devoted to uh, economic analysis. And it was required that the division director signed off on all rulemakings. And that really uh, you know, put a sort of structural and institutional um, uh, hurdle for all the other divisions, which were primarily legal in uh, composition, to, uh, to pass. And it, uh, and it turned out was very important. Uh, my predecessor came and reorganized the organization and made a separate office of chief Econ the office of chief economist, and sort of took away that required sign off, making the chief economist's office sort of a consultant to the entire commission. It worked great when uh, when uh, you know I was there as a commissioner and acting chairman, being being an economist, um, you know, could absolutely ensure that uh, economic analysis uh, was used in the rulemaking uh, and interpretive process. Um, some examples, I think I promised you I'd give you a couple of, of examples where we considered uh, 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 the costs and benefits and did formal studies. Uh, the first would be on uh, position limits and speculative, we call them speculative limits, and they're limits on the size of positions that can be taken uh, by financial entities or entities uh, generally in uh, futures and options and, and derivatives markets. Uh, we charged, uh, the, the, the concern was that the speculation was causing uh, commodity prices to rise. Um, so we commissioned our, our uh, chief economist office and our, our academic economists to uh, do a, a, a rigorous study. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that was mostly due to our, our view that, um, that you can uh, bring a lot of, of rigor uh, and, and, and quality to analysis of some of these uh, financial questions uh, by evaluating financial market data, by uh, uh, calling to financial entities and uh, users of markets to provide uh, data to uh, this, 
to the agency to, to analyze. Um, uh, they uh, did a, a, a good study. It actually uh, ended up uh, uh, supporting uh, some of the um, uh, positions that uh, we, we had uh, regarding um, how to use those limits only during uh, time periods of, of uh, sort of uh, expiration of the contracts and periods where there were uh, uh, important um, uh, sort of uh, economics at play. Um, and uh, that, uh, it, it, it's interesting because even though the study and the analysis supported uh, the view that uh, the CFTC had the right approach and that the, um, you know, that there was no need for sort of uh, a federal level of uh, position limits, Lo and behold, when Dodd-Frank occurred uh, in 2010, that issue came back uh, to, uh, in legislation that uh, asked and, and gave the CFTC additional authority um, uh, to set position limits, basically economic constraints on uh, speculative trading. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, the pendulum kind of swings um, as uh, the political climate changes, uh, and also as, in, 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 as you know, I don't think that uh, the size of positions uh, in speculation in the derivatives, uh, regulated derivatives industry necessarily had anything to do with the financial crisis, but it still made its way into, uh, into the law. And uh, as, as Hester mentioned, um, uh, the implementation process has resulted in uh, some legal challenges to the CFTC's rulemakings uh, because uh, they have not uh, been able to establish uh, the necessity f and um, uh, the benefits exceed the cost of, uh, of their rulemaking in that area. Okay. Thanks, Sharon. Um, now, John, uh, do you think economic analysis actually improves the rulemaking process, or do you see problems in that? And feel free to specify what you, how you're using it. Yeah, so um, I'm going to add a couple of additional complications to Jerry's good sketch earlier of how to think about cost-benefit analysis before I answer your question. Um, I think it's important when people are talking about economic analysis to keep in mind two dimensions of analysis, and then two ways in which it gets implemented. One dimension of analysis is sort of qualitative, conceptual, under just thinking through rigorously using economic tools and models what the likely consequences of a given rule or the absence of a rule or alternatives to the rule might be. That's distinguishable from what Jerry described as a caricature earlier, which is trying to monetize and quantify all of the potential costs and benefits of different options. Um, although it is, I think I agree with you that it's often a caricature, it is this quantification image is often a, a, a way that people describe the agencies as failing in their regulatory impact analysis because they're not quantifying everything. And I just want to up front distinguish, you can do the first qualitative um, quite well without being able to achieve much at all in the second category. Um, and you can kid yourself about the second category in ways that can mislead you, I think, in how you do the qualitative analysis. So that's the first difference. Another difference to keep in mind is policy versus law. I'm a law professor, so I think a lot about law. A lot of economists, when they hear about economic analysis, well, of course, agencies should use economic analysis. That's my profession. It's a good idea to think through the economics. But often what people are really talking about, and I suspect many people in this room get this immediately, is not using a particular mode of analysis, but a set of legal rules that require the agencies to go through a certain regulatory process. That's implicit in the way Heather was describing some of the requirements uh, imposed on the agencies. Um, and uh, you can be completely in favor of economic analysis as a matter of policy without necessarily thinking that a particular set of legal institutions to implement uh, economic analysis is a good thing. 
Um, and I, and I, I, I very much am of the first view that economic analysis is incredibly helpful, particularly if it's qualitative and modest and careful. Uh, I'm not at all sure whether some, at least, of the legal institutions designed to force it uh, as part of a, a, a regulatory process are necessarily a good thing. And just to illustrate why, um, John earlier sold you his paper. I'll sell you, I have a Yale Law, Law Review paper that's coming out that's on, it's on the web. You can find it too, where I went through six major rules in detail to try to figure out what would be involved if the caricature version was what we were trying to achieve. If we were trying to quantify the costs and benefits, for example, of the Volcker rule, and then I have five others if you're interested. Different agencies, different rules, different targets. Um, and the bottom line of the, of, of the case studies is we just can't do that. We can't do it with a straight face for most major types of rules. And I, I go on for 150 pages as to why. I'll give you one right now. One reason why is because to really quantify you need reliable inferences about the causal effect of the rule. You need to be able to see what effect it's going to have. And to do that in advance for major types of financial regulation is often impossible because the data just isn't there to do responsible quantitative analysis. Moreover, you can't, you usually cannot run experiments uh, off in a lab somewhere and draw any kind of inference about how the rule will play out in the real world. Occasionally you can. The SEC just this week announced a pilot study of their tick size rule, which is exactly of that kind. But that, I would say, is an exception that proves the rule. It's the context in which you can actually set up controls to draw inferences pretty carefully. Volcker rule, how would you do that? Uh, imagine trying to run an experiment with the Volcker rule. It's very hard to imagine how to do it. So if we understand impact analysis, economic analysis to be conceptual, and if we understand it to be a policy tool, I'm all in favor of it. If we think about it as a mandate to do quantification in contexts where, frankly, the people in, in, in given this job will just be making numbers up, camouflaging what they're doing with things that look very impressive but, in fact, don't really have a lot under them once you press uh, beyond the first level, and worse, I think, asking courts to review that kind of thing, I, I, that's where I start to get very queasy. Okay. Thanks, John. Now, uh, Jerry, let me turn it over to you. And can you talk about what happens in the exec among the executive branch agencies? Uh, does economic analysis actually help in, in your view? Oh, sure. Yeah. It's it's a little complicated to give a simple answer, but the the simplest answer I can give is that. Um, you know, there is research that shows that economic analysis does sometimes lead to better decisions uh, about regulations in executive branch agencies. It's not clear that, it cons that it's consistently and widely used, though. Uh, let me unpack that a little bit. A few examples. Probably one of the most classic examples of the use of analysis of benefits and costs to explore alternatives uh, was, is, and it's written up several places, is the story of uh, EPA regulations removing lead from gasoline during the Reagan administration, where the analysis of alternatives revealed that the benefits of getting a lead out of gasoline were so big that lead was actually phased out more quickly than the administration originally planned to phase it out. Uh, and I think there was also a bit of assessment of alternatives that found that if you if you do some things with, with credit trading and so forth to make it more flexible, you can do it as, at lower cost as well. Uh, a lot more recently, there was a regulation adopted on uh, last year or two on uh, flight time, uh, duty times and rest times for airline flight crews. And the original proposed version of the regulation would apply it to all airlines. Uh, when the regulatory impact analysis was redone a little more carefully and refined, it turned out that the benefits of applying this to cargo airlines, cargo only airlines, were very small. Why? Because you know, most of the damage, if you have a, uh, a crash or a problem with a cargo airline, most of, the most of the damage is stuff, not people. Passenger airlines, on the other hand, you have a lot, you know, a lot more lives at stake. And so the final version of the regulation uh, made the regulation uh, optional for cargo airlines, but applied it to passenger airlines. So it significantly reduced the cost and, and probably led to a better decision. There are also examples of where failure to do analysis uh, 
at least might lead one to question whether the agency is making sensible decisions. Uh, by the way, I, I commend all of this uh, with a background in economic regulation, uh, not specifically uh, financial, uh, but I can understand the financial stuff a lot better than, say, the health and safety type regulation. And I've spent a lot of time looking at the Federal Communications Commission. The Federal Communications Commission for years has administered subsidy programs that essentially uh, charge you a fee on your phone bill to pay for something called universal service. Uh, which is essentially a subsidized telephone service for people with low incomes and for people like me who live in rural areas. Thank you very much. Um, turns out that the F when the FCC started this program, it never really defined what it was trying to accomplish or what would count as success. And it did not do this for 10 years. Uh, I mean, you know, implicitly, politically, what seemed to count as success is the money kept flowing. I mean, I've had FCC staffers tell me that. Look, the, you know, all Congress cares about is that the money's flowing into companies in, in, their, in their districts. Okay, but that's not really a good measure of how well does this uh, whole uh, subsidy system that's administered through regulation benefit the public. Uh, and the Government Accountability Office finally called the FCC on this. Uh, and a couple of years ago, they finally said, okay, we're going to define what we're trying to accomplish, and then we're going to try to have some measures to see if the program really is accomplishing it. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about 5 to $10 billion a year since the program started uh, that was dished out without really a clear idea of what was being accomplished. Uh, I suspect that may, there may be some not-so-good regulatory decisions that were made because uh, the FCC didn't even take the first step of trying to define what outcome it was trying to achieve, or in you know, economist lingo, the benefits that it was trying to create. So there are examples of where you get better decisions with good analysis, examples of where you get uh, questionable decisions when there is no good analysis. And quite frankly, I know from our regulatory report card project at the Mercatus Center, where we evaluate the quality of analysis that, it, that uh, executive branch agencies do, and also look at the extent to which they claim to have used it, there are a lot of cases where analysis isn't so good and agencies also don't really claim to use it very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Jerry. Now, uh, Sharon, you're now at NERA and you've continued to develop your approach to applying economic analysis to thinking about financial market rules. Can you elaborate on what that entails? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was kind of inspired by uh, uh, Professor Coates' remarks in, uh, on this. I mean, I. I really disagree fundamentally that you can't do quantitative analysis of some of these big uh, rules. I mean, I think you, it, it, admittedly, there are, um, there are challenges. I, I think you have to look at it broadly, as, as, and, and, and that I do agree with, that you need us to do so. You have to bring in the qualitative, um, qualitative kind of thought process. You have to... Uh, engage uh, in some uh, predictive um, analysis based on, um, a, in some case, very standard tools that economists use uh, in forecasting and evaluation of other markets that uh, may have uh, similar rules. Um, so, I, you know, I think, and I think, um, you know, in my experience um, with Dodd-Frank, one of the the areas that I've really focused uh, since I've left the commission, and it, it kind of makes sense, is the Title VII of the Dodd-Frank Act, which mostly uh, is focused on derivative assets uh, and swaps that are used by uh, the large financial institutions and non-financial, uh, ener big energy companies, uh, airlines, uh, agriculture interests, um, you know, a little co-op that I worked for in Nebraska. All of these uh, firms are users of uh, swaps to manage and mitigate risk. Um, and so I think one of the big fallacies of the Dodd-Frank Act was that somehow these, the derivatives uh, caused the financial crisis. Um, and so that, uh, that, you know, brought about Title VII, which has a significant amount of, uh, of, of, of rules uh, focused on uh, the swap dealer community uh, to, uh, to, to uh, 
reduce their use of swaps to raise the cost of capital um, that they uh, and the, the amount of regulatory capital that they hold uh, again to, to, to in, in some sense some of this is good if it's uh, again to reduce the leverage that uh, that uh, this morning's uh, speaker mentioned um, that uh, we saw the sort of short-term leverage issues um, Volcker rule is one of those uh, issues that I've also written about um, did a Financial Times uh, piece on it uh, as well, um, basically because I thought that um, it was uh, trying to, um, you know, sort of uh, pro provide sort of what I call medieval medicine to uh, the problem of, uh, of, of, of an illness. Uh, try to cut off, the, cut off the arm because you know you've got a, a scratch on it. Um, thinking that somehow we could do bloodletting and that would solve uh, all the the problems that we saw in the financial crisis and the risk that we saw. Volcker basically um, takes the uh, banks out of uh, the financial uh, their their activities in the swaps and their speculation. Uh, or trading or market making in the market. And what we see is in the work that I've done uh, at, at NERA uh, as an economist, we've, we've uh, been asked to look at a number of rules related to uh, swap dealer registration, uh, business conduct and compliance, uh, their activities of market making in uh, the swaps and, and, and which and we found that you know they're very important uh, contributors to liquidity and market efficiency um, and uh, the changes that have uh, that have been contemplated sometimes result in unintended co consequences uh, for the larger uh, uh, both the financial institutions, the larger marketplace, my co-op in Nebraska, you know, and the, the economy in the U.S., the national economy and the economy at large. Um, just a couple of uh, findings uh, in our analysis of the swap dealer uh, registration. We found that the CFTC's interpretation of what constitutes a swap dealer using a sort of how much swaps they do approach resulted in pulling in a substantial amount of end users of energy uh, large commercial energy firms that uh, were not acting as swap dealers, but instead were, um, again, providing uh, important uh, liquidity and, and activity to the markets. Um, and, and we can see, uh, we also evaluated uh, the impact, the larger impact on financial markets, and we saw that um, there's a, t that you can see that some of the rulemakings have actually uh, caused a, um, smaller financial institutions because the cost of compliance with uh, the regulatory program, including Volcker uh, and the swap dealer uh, program, have actually caused the smaller financial institutions uh, and, uh, and sometimes the non-financial institutions that routinely make markets, the Cargills, the, you know, the big ag, they're actually withdrawing from, from the market. Um, so, you know, there's the impact on liquidity, there's the impact of trading costs, um, there's a lot, there's a volume decline uh, at large in, in these markets that, and, and even some of the products that are offered to the end users, like the co-op in Nebraska, are, uh, are, are costing those end users more uh, if they still care to use them. Um, so, so I guess what I would say is yes, um, that, you know, these things are in some sense were predictable. Uh, economists could see that, that, that these could happen. And it's very important that you take this sort of broad approach and look at all the potential unintended consequences as part of a, 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 a cost benefit analysis. Okay, thanks, uh, Sharon. Now, let's say we're going forward. John and Hester, I'm going to ask you. I'll start with Hester, but I'll ask you uh, both the same question, basically. So when it comes to financial market regulators performing economic analysis, do you think the statutory obligation should be strengthened, weakened, left alone? So I think that you'll get two different answers to your, to yeah. your same question. I do think that building a requirement 
into the, the statutes of all the financial regulators makes sense. So it would be a requirement to do uh, economic analysis according to steps laid out in the statute. And the reason I think it's necessary to do that is that if you don't put it in the statute, as we've seen, the regulators just don't take it very seriously. Now, the SEC had this requirement for a long time, and then finally it got taken to court, and it got taken to court again, and then it started to think, well, maybe we should take this seriously. The staff put out a memo which laid out steps that they should take in connection with rulemakings, and that memo draws heavily upon work that the, the Office of Management and Budgets, OIRA, uh, office, which handles the executive order economic analysis. So it draws heavily on the work they've done, and it, it tries to build that in. But we've seen that it took the court to push the SEC to go in that direction. Now, Jerry and I worked on a, a paper where we looked at a number of SEC rules that were pre-memo, so before they put this process in place. And we found that they performed uh, about half as well as the executive agencies in terms of um, how they perform their economic analysis and use their economic analysis. Um, so we're hoping that there'll be improvement. It's probably still too early to tell. I think they're, they're starting to integrate these procedures, but it takes time. Um, but more broadly, I would say that, that putting in a requirement for the other agencies to perform an analysis and then to be subject on the back end to uh, potential review by a court is important. Now, one thing that's important to build into that requirement is a requirement for retrospective review so that when you actually write the rule, you pick metrics and you say, this is how we're going to define success. So this can avoid some of the problems that Jerry was just mentioning. So that when you're adopting the rule, you're saying, this is what we think would be success. And then a few years later, three years, five years, you're going back and you're saying, okay, now according to those metrics we laid out, how, do, how are we doing? Is this rule working as we intended, or should we scrap it or amend it? Okay, thanks, Hester. Now, John, same question. So when it comes to applying economic analysis, uh, at least for financial market regulators, should the statutory obligations be strengthened? So, um, no. Um, um, I'll, I'll explain why. With one caveat, where actually I agree complete with Hester. I, I, I endorse the idea of a retrospective approach that's um, part of the uh, Fed transparency bill that Representative Hengeling will be presumably talking about at least um, in passing later today. Um, I think that's a sensible approach precisely because it puts the analysis after the information is available. Um, one word on Volcker just to explain why I'm so skeptical of quantification of something like Volcker in advance and maybe even after the fact but certainly in advance. The principal benefit of the Volcker Rule, at least according to the people who back it, including the former chairman of the Fed, Paul Volcker, is that it will reduce the risk of systemic crises like the ones we just went through. To know whether that's true, to know what the benefit of that reduction is, you have to have a model and data of crises. There haven't been more than 100 financial crises in world history, thankfully. Um, so from an economist's perspective, from an econometrician's stat statistical perspective, that gives you relatively little information to work with to know how big they are, how big the future ones are likely to be, and what impact the Volcker Rule will have on it. It makes very challenging any estimate of the benefits of the rule. Some of the costs are equally hard to measure in advance. Liquidity costs, for example, the, uh, Sharon, you mentioned withdrawal of markets from um, uh, some of the market makers. Um, in advance, I think it would have been very difficult to know exactly how many of them would do that, how many other market participants would take their place, and so anticipate precisely because it's hard to anticipate the consequences of regulation, which is, of course, a standard reason to worry about regulation. It also makes the job of quantifying in advance very challenging. That's part of why I think strength, strengthening the statutory obligations and giving the courts a role in this is problematic. Just to say two things about that. The courts are generalists. They're former litigators. They're not economists. They're not people who've spent any amount of time thinking about the content of the regulation in detail. They are also political appointees. And the DC Circuit in particular, increasingly, in my view, is becoming a political lottery. 
Sometimes you get this panel, which you guys might like. Sometimes you get another panel, which you guys would not like. The outcome of a regulatory process, in my view, should not depend upon the results of a political lottery. And if you hand the courts more tools in the form of statutory obligations the agencies have to go through that the courts can then say, well, in our judgment, you didn't do it the right way, I think you're just asking for it. And let me emphasize this point, deregulatory changes to be struck down as well as regulatory changes improvements in regulation that, that would be consensus improvements to be struck down as well as ones that are much more politically controversial. I just think in general the courts ought to be, as the Supreme Court has told the DC Circuit in the past, very deferential when it comes to scientific judgment, but you can't count on political appointees on the bench to necessarily follow that instruction. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, so now let me throw it out to the panel. Here's an open question. Let's say you want to increase transparency, uh, accountability, and we have a lot of smart people in this town. You want to make the best use of expertise uh, when it comes to rulemaking. Does economic analysis achieve those goals, or do you, do you have any other recommendations instead? I certainly think it, it helps to achieve those goals. I wouldn't say economic analysis is, is the solution to the problem. I mean. It, we can talk about other solutions. Uh, simplifying rules would also help so that people could know what they had to comply with and it would be easier maybe to figure out what the consequences of rules would be if they were simpler. But having economic analysis, I look at it kind of like it's a flashlight, right? So right now the regulators are in a dark room, they're trying to get from one end to the other and you say, hey, we have a flashlight for you to use. And the regulators say, no, 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 I don't want to use a flashlight. I would just prefer to feel my way in the dark and trip over things. And, you know, why not use a flashlight? Is it going to be perfect? Is it going to illuminate every corner of the room? Absolutely not. But is it going to help you get from one end to the other without stubbing your toe? Yeah, so you might as well, you might as well use it. So I can I jump in? I, I'm a fan of economic analysis, just yeah, as I yeah. said earlier. And the way I would get there, there was not through the courts. I would get there by funding it. So Congress could tie funding to expenditure on trained economists. It's like a very simple, blunt tool. But it seems to me far more likely to generate change within the institutions. I mean, it, this is something you alluded to earlier, actually giving power within the institution to somebody who's trained to do economic analysis seems to me far more likely to achieve the result of economic, good economic analysis than to ask a court to review what the agency has done uh, after the fact. So I would tie funding and then I would also encourage um, uh, those in positions to influence the appointment process at the political appointee level to think hard about putting people with economic training on the agency staffs and not simply put uh, legal, legally trained people, which is uh, unfortunately characteristic of many of the agencies. On the other hand, the Fed, I think, could use a couple of people who know something about law, um, uh, whatever you think of Dan Tarullo. Uh, he adds a dimension of knowledge that macroeconomists don't have, and I think that's actually an important thing to have in the conversation, at least in part. I think over, over the past uh, five years, thanks, thanks to our regulatory re report card project, I think I've spent more time reading regulatory impact analyses and notices of proposed rulemaking than any sane human being should <laughs> spend in, in the course of five years. And, and you asked about the effects on, particularly on transparency and, and accountability. Generalizing from the experience of going through all of this stuff, I think it is a lot easier to figure out what a regulation is supposed to accomplish and how or whether we will know it accomplished that when it's accompanied by a good regulatory impact analysis that actually addresses the problem the agency's trying to solve, looks at alternatives, and then looks at benefits and costs of alternatives. Because if you've done all that, then you can also develop metrics that help you figure out okay, in the future, how will we evaluate whether this was a success or not? And then you actually have the beginnings of some, some accountability. Um, are the regulations issued by this agency you know, accomplishing some particular goals uh, or not further down the road? Um, I can also think of plenty of cases where I've read notices of proposed rulemaking and find it really hard to figure out what a regulation is going to accomplish or supposed to accomplish when the accompanying analysis uh, is, is not very good. 
So certainly, I think from both the transparency and accountability uh, perspective, uh, we get an improvement when we have an, as good as an, an, when we have a good analysis. Is it as good as it ought to be? As good as I would like it to be? As good as it should be? No, nah, probably not. Uh, but seeing seeing regulations issued with a good analysis and without a good analysis, yeah, there's there's an improvement in transparency there when you have a good analysis and an improvement in, in accountability. Yeah, I would just uh, add, I mean, I couldn't be uh, agree more with everyone that's just spoken. I mean, I think that um, it's important to have this transparency. I'm really pleased that in the sort of post-Dodd-Frank period, we've seen, uh, you know, a more, a great, in some sense, a, a, an increased awareness of how cost-benefit analysis or economic analysis, the role that it can play in uh, policy making. It's, it's uh, you know, um, I, I think a number of commissioners, you're going to hear today uh, Commissioner Gallagher and, and Amelia from the CFTC talk about um, their experience in using cost-benefit analysis at the agency level independent and how it, it how it, uh, I, I mean, I when I hear both of those gentlemen speak, I see that they have really a, a high level of appreciation for that. Uh, for that, and that that's important. It, it also allows others, if we have agencies hardwired, required to do this type of analysis, it allows others like economists at the Cato Institute, at, you know, at Mercatus Center, at other u great universities across the country to actually scrutinize uh, the analysis that the agencies are doing. So that's important. And finally, on the accountability side, that improves accountability, but also I think the the, the fact that we do have the, the ability to, to uh, and that entities af really affected by the rulemaking have the ability to raise a court challenge as they have in the position limits, the SIFMA and ISDA versus the CFTC as other entities have raised challenges to the SEC. That's, again, a very important accountability a factor, whether or not the courts are, are equipped to do this, it, um, you know, th to, uh, to make judgments or second guess the agency, somebody's got to, right? So we've got to have that layer of accountability. Um, and, and, and so I, you know, it, it's important, I think, for looking forward. Okay, thanks, Sharon. Uh, now, John, I just want to say, get this clear, you actually want more economists in no? I do. Okay. I do. I'm in favor of it, and fewer lawyers, uh, okay. notwithstanding my my job. <laughs> well, there is a you know there is a, a sort of marriage between law and economics that yeah. uh, we're all I think big fans of on this panel, and and I think that uh, it's it, it's usually uh, you know you don't want to you don't want to take the zoo approach to constituting an agency. Some of the best economists I've met are lawyers. And uh, you know, so and vice versa. So some of the best lawyers I've met are economists, uh, and and some of them I, I think uh, uh, I think Gordon Tullock uh, at, Merc at Mercatus and, and, and G George Mason and some others. Uh, so we certainly have no uh, no can't draw our lines too too narrowly there. And I really like the idea of tying the budget because that means that the CFPB's budget would then be. Uh, appropriated, which would be a great change, too, so we could kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> okay, any other thoughts? I think we are, we can now transition to the Q&A, so please join me in thanking our panelists. Okay, so as Dino said earlier, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to ask a question, please line up. You'll see the standing mic, one over there, one over there, and I'll alternate between mics. Hi, um, my name is Zach Israel, and uh, I guess my, my question is, well, first I'll say Chris Dodd spoke yesterday at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And one of the things he commented on during the whole process of making the Dodd-Frank Act and passing it that he wished had happened that did not happen was creating one prudential regulator in the federal government. Hmm. And, 
you know, look at the Volcker rule. You had five. You had the OCC, the Fed, the FDIC, the SEC, the CFTC having to work together to create this, this massive rule. And his whole thought process was, why not consolidate all many of these regulators together uh, to streamline the process so that things don't fall through the cracks that would allow um, a large financial crisis to happen in the future? Um, and, a, and another example of this is you know, the SEC and the CFTC. There's a lot of overlap in, in certain rules that, that Dodd-Frank called for that they don't have to work together necessarily. They probably should, but they're not necessarily required to. So I guess my question is, do you think it would be beneficial to have one prudential regulator with, in regard to many different issues, especially cost-benefit analysis? So instead of having all these separate entities doing it on their own, have one streamlined process um, instead? I think that there, there would be some benefit from that in terms of analysis because one of the problems is when you're, you're, you're adopting 400 rules at the same time, it's difficult to know which benefit and which cost comes from which rule. So having some sort of a broader look at what the costs and benefits of Dodd-Frank as a whole are, for example, would have been helpful. And that would be more likely to get accomplished if you had one regulator doing everything. There are a lot of complications with that as well, but certainly taking away the Fed's regulatory responsibilities and moving it into another entity would, would I think, be beneficial. Uh, the, the competition between the SEC and CFTC has not been particularly helpful during this process. I mean, we have the CFTC, which has the bulk of the swaps market and um, the SEC has some knowledge that would be very useful for the CFTC to use in its, in its process, but the CFTC was so busy trying to be the first through the gate adopting rules that they didn't have time to listen to the SEC. And so I think, you know, increasing coordination would help. Now that said, the, the FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, was, among other things, supposed to kind of bring all the regulators together in one place so that they could talk about things. Um, but they've instead focused most of their energies on um, trying to create new too-big-to-fail institutions. Thanks. I, I would just agree, I mean, on that. I, would, I think that, and I, of course, I speak from my experience at the CFTC and how long it took the CFTC and the SEC to reach agreement. Um, and, uh, the, you know, this, this idea that they could harmonize their regulations has always been a, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's been such a challenge. Uh, I, I have been there when, um, you know, the CFTC sort of draws the line and the SEC draws the line on what they want. And basically it's just a jurisdictional uh, jump ball. Um, and, and you said, you know, the, the CFTC trying to become the first out of the gate, I think, I was just quoted in the um, in, in Risk magazine. It was also the the CFTC had this ready or not here I come approach to uh, global regulations. They've interpreted uh, this, the Dodd Frank to mean that they have regulation over uh, otherwise regulated foreign financial institutions. And boy, that's really put uh, the U.S. in a good stead with uh, foreign regulators and. Um, and also, uh, it, it's created uh, entities, uh, you know, there's a sort of a, a movement of uh, financial entities of business and commercial activity uh, to foreign jurisdictions to avoid uh, what they regard as onerous uh, and expansive U.S. interpretation of uh, of, of their jurisdiction and of different facets of the law. So there's definitely a lot of, again, uh, unintended consequences from the, um, you know, from the, the, the regulatory program, from a lack of sort of cohesion, cohesion between the, in, the independent agencies. And, uh, I, you know, but I'm not sure that creating a monolithic uh, structure under uh, the CSFB has, has really resolved the problem in, by any stretch of the word. Um, you know, we, we, again, we, one of the big issues is how they have uh, studied and recommended, I guess, a, uh, uh, 
a, a sort of bank-like regulatory program for asset managers. Professor Cochran talked about that this morning and how that was basically a bad idea because that's the kind of risk capital that you don't want to have uh, bank-like protections of. So, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't have an answer to that to that question, but I, I'd say it raises a lot of uh, interesting sort of institutional questions. Anyone else? I, the only thing I'd say is it's complicated also by, frankly, the, the more, the larger the jurisdiction of an agency, the more political clout it has. And I'm not sure that I want one large political gorilla among the financial agencies. I kind of like having them fight with each other sometimes. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, I, I don't really have a position to try to sell on this, but I'll just make an observation that I, I, I used to work over there for a couple of years, which is, that's the Federal Trade Commission building that you can, you can see out some of the windows over there. And so, the, so I'm suspicious of a monopoly of anything, <laughs> uh, whether, especially regulators, uh, whether we're talking about within a nation or internationally where everybody tries to harmonize regulations rather than uh, with the, that can turn into you know, kind of a cartel where we all get the worst possible regulation rather than you know, having some diversity. So I, I, mean, I know in, in the past it's been useful sometimes when you have several different regulators regulating similar things and one of them does something a little odd, it's nice to be able to point to another regulator and say, Wait, no, wait, see, there is kind of a, a more workable way to do this uh, other than what this one agency is doing that's a little odd right now. So uh, maybe that's my bias as a researcher, too. It's nice to have the variation. So then it's easier to figure out uh, <laughs> you know, how stuff happens and maybe easier to, f easier to uh, quantify some of this stuff because we have our experiments out there. Uh, yes, please. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Charles Ellison here with the uh, Philadelphia Tribune, um, which I'm told is the uh, moderator's hometown. Um, I, I thanks so much for, for having the panel. Uh, this is just sort of a, a clarification question here. I don't profess to be an expert in the, in the space. So we talked a lot about uh, sort of the adjustments uh, that uh, these various regulatory agencies would make uh, with some sort of uh, EA mandate of some sort. So I'm, I'm real curious about your thoughts on the, the impact at institutions, the financial institutions, the entities, um, you, you've mentioned that briefly during this discussion. H how do they respond to that? So, so how do they respond to suddenly uh, an, an army of, of economic analysts? Um, how do those institutions make adjustments? How do their business units, how do their compliance units make that adjustment? Do they suddenly have to hire armies of economic analysts uh, to essentially talk with those uh, with those regulators during that process, uh, what sort of technology uh, do they need to rely on in that in that data transfer that's going to take place as those EAs, I guess we'll, we'll call them for lack of a better acronym, uh, as they're sifting through that that information and trying to come up with a good uh, cost benefit analysis. So I'm real curious to kind of get your thoughts on that. Hey, can, can I just I, I'll give you a partial answer. I mean, just to be clear. All of the financial regulatory agencies already and for a long time have had many PhD economists on their staffs. So uh, the current uh, Division of Economic Research at SEC was preceded by Fiskgren, and it's been around for a long time, and they have had 50 or 50 plus PhD economists on staff, by the way, as many or more than OIRA, uh, which has to cope with the entirety of the non-financial, non-independent um, side of the government. So I, I don't think we're, anybody really would be talking about a massive change, but it would be incremental and marginal. And yes, they'd have to hire more people if uh, economic analysis were play a bigger role in, especially in the early stages of regulatory um, proposals. Currently, unfortunately, they tend to be introduced late in the, in the process as a way of responding to the court demand. So they're functioning as, as handmaidens to the litigators rather than actually early in the process, which is where I think they would do more good. Um, and so the real question is how do you get people at the top, how do you get political appointees to understand the benefit that they can add from the beginning? Um, and that's, that's a difficult management challenge, I think, more than anything else. Yeah, I, th I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, that what we're talking about is analysis 
that agencies would need to do when they are thinking of or proposing new regulations. And that doesn't mean that the regulated firms would have to do anything else. They might find it in their interest to maybe supply more economic analysis uh, on the public, as part of the public record that the agency uses to make decisions. They might find it in their interest to disclose more data that could be used to figure out some stuff. Uh, and, and those would probably be good things. Uh, but having, uh, requiring a regulatory agency to say, you know, produce more careful and thoughtful analysis when it regulates uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the regulated firms have to do anything uh, differently, you know, other than the fact that, I mean, hopefully we would get regulation that's in some sense better, and so the substance of the regulation would be different, and hopefully the compliance cost would be lower. Um, but yeah, I don't know that this, this would really translate into any sort of automatic new mandates on the regulated firms themselves. Anyone? No? No? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the question is specifically to uh, Mrs. Brown Roshka. Uh, I suppose your assurance was a bit baffling. The simple question is what is the level of confidence on the predictability ex ante? It seems to me Professor Cott is onto something here. Take an example AIG, JP Morgan. AIG's own model before. The you know what hit the you know what in 2007 and all the way to 2008 somewhere close you know, to March of 2008 was calling for a de minimis probability of the occurrence of the event exposed. JP Morgan exits its position because of the fact that, as Jamie Dimon himself put it, no one within the structure could tell precisely what were the potential costs. So I suppose the question is, what is the framework you propose ex ante for ex post? We may have an inkling of what is the optimal framework. Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, I think that um, there was, uh, AIG is always sort of this uh, sample of one uh, basis of regulation for regulation of the uh, entire swaps and derivatives industry. Um, uh, AIG was regulated, and that's probably why we no longer have the Office of Thrift Supervision, um, because they were, uh, you know, the, their, the risks on their books that they were taking, huge uh, short exposure, uh, uh, were, were not caught by their, uh, by their supervisors at OTS, uh, were not mitigated in any way. That's a failure of, of the existing uh, structure of regulation, and that's why I think we uh, strengthened the prudential regulatory authorities. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to, um, to pull all banks out of uh, the trade of derivatives and uh, financial risk management tools. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to move the entirety of uh, the trade of derivatives and uh, financial instruments on to uh, exchanges. Certainly, um, improving the transparency is, is a positive uh, thing, uh, and, and, and that uh, through exchange trading has occurred. But um, there's, uh, I would say that, you know, regulation, uh, we, we tend to overreact in the legislative process. I think Dodd-Frank, we have to all agree, was uh, a, a, an attempt uh, to, a, a massive attempt to solve every problem. And, and that's why I think that it, and it, and it, has, uh, it has, in many respects, overshot, I think, the goal it uh, is trying to solve problems that maybe uh, could have been solved by just st strengthening the existing uh, regulatory model of supervision of entities that take risks. I think in the case of J.P. Morgan, that's another example where uh, certainly they have uh, banking regulators who should have been looking at uh, their portfolio uh, and uh, providing uh, and, and feedback, and I, I, as I understand it, there were uh, uh, cases and uh, actions brought against them uh, for for that uh, level of risk taking that took place. So to make a short story long, I think that um, 
you know, that there, there, there are real uh, actions that be, can be taken. It does not necessarily dictate a whole new regulatory uh, program uh, for the financial products that are so important to uh, risk management. It just means that we need better, more effective enforcement of uh, the rules that we have on the books. And one thing I would throw in there is that AI, about half of AIG's problems actually stemmed from their regulated insurance company's securities lending program. No one likes to talk about that because they like to use AIG as an, as, as an example of why we need more regulation. And I would argue regulation is not actually the answer. The answer is probably more along the lines of what Professor Cochran was talking about this morning of trying to make companies themselves watch their own risks instead of relying on their regulators to tell them when they're doing something stupid. No, that's true. Good point. And on that note, Professor Cochran. Uh, so John Cochran, University of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, what you seem to have agreed on is that part of the uh, economic, ana economic analysis is good, uh, some of it ahead of time to try and ward off truly stupid ideas. Uh, a lot of it retrospective as we learn, we inevitably learn and, and change our minds and gain experience. Uh, you've also persuaded me that retrospective through the courts is a bad idea. Courts are good at did you follow process, but not very good at the process was followed, but we learned a lot about the science. Uh, so retrospective, you suggested putting economists in charge. I know a lot of economists. I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> sometimes oh, they well. don't come from Chicago or George Mason. They come from Harvard, Princeton, and, and Berkeley. And, and most, of our, <laughs> most of our policy disasters of the last uh, decade have had many, many economists in charge of, of setting them up. So what the question now, because they have to end with question marks, what is the right structure for an effective uh, retrospective uh, reconsideration uh, of, uh, of, of the economic analysis underlying regulation, especially when regulations work in pairs or, or dysfunction in pairs? So I'll throw, I don't have a magic bullet, but I have thought a little bit about some more micro institutional design. I'll throw out a couple ideas. One, currently, at least in the multi-member um, commissioner agencies, it's only the chair who has the direct line to the economic staff. And I think that's a problem. I think it would be helpful. It's not What I just said is a simplification. There is some communication. But nevertheless, in terms of being able to generate genuine dialogue among all of the multi-member commissioners with the economic staff, I think much more could be done. I think much more could be done to generate at the staff level some real back and forth and, and, and strong consideration than is currently being done. Um, that's one idea. Um, another is, um, and this goes a little bit to the idea of institutional consolidation, um, without going all the way there, you could imagine pretty common um, rotations of economic economists from agency to agency, secondments, if you will, multi-year, so that a person from the Fed who has the Fed's perspective actually spends some time at the CFTC and could learn what those markets are like and bring that wisdom back. It's currently never done, uh, except voluntarily by people just happening to follow career paths of that kind. So more deliberate thought about how to share information among the agencies, and it also would be a debiasing. So you might have a Harvard person uh, taking on a Chicago person from time to time within uh, different institutional settings, and you might get more light uh, that way. But. So and I sort of have a similar answer to that to that last one what i would suggest is that you would have the agency itself would do the retrospective review but then that review would be reviewed by some of his peers at another agency so that you it would be if if the economists at the particular agency wanted to do a sham job they'd at least have to be embarrassed in front of their colleagues at another agency well let me sell you a paper <laughs> uh, i didn't write it uh, a couple of our colleagues at the Mercatus Center, the Richard Williams and Patrick McLaughlin, uh, re recently uh, put out a working paper in which they tried to address this issue. And their suggestion is, uh, and also one, another one of our colleagues, Jerry Brito, has written about this. Their suggestion is that the, the retrospective analysis shouldn't be done in the agency. Uh, instead, it ought to be done by an independent entity uh, more like the uh, Base Realignment and Closure Commission uh, where the independent entity is, is given a job by Congress and told, you know, you're supposed to use certain objective criteria recommending what regulations to retain, which ones to modify, and so forth. 
um, so that you don't have the situation where the agency feels compelled to produce an analysis that defends its past decisions. Uh, where, I mean, you know, even if those decisions were made by um, political appointees from the previous administration, there's a tr you know, tremendous amount of inertia in this town, tremendous tendency to, to say as an entity, uh, you know, our, our analysis is gonna, is gonna show that whatever it is we're doing now is still necessary. You have occasional um, exceptions to that rule. I remember the, the Department of Transportation eliminated its regulations outlawing uh, bias in airline computerized reservation systems after they did a retrospective study that found airlines had divested the systems uh, and they also found that most people go and book their own fares on the internet anyway. So the original problem that gave rise to that regulation had disappeared. Uh, that happened after they were kind of beaten up by the Office of Management and Budget, I think. So, so even in that case where the objective situation is pretty obvious, it, it, was, a real, uh, it was a real struggle. So uh, having, having an entity outside the agency responsible for the retrospective anal analysis may be the way to go. So this sounds like the OERA. Do you guys like that? Well, I, I would put OFR forward if I were to pick one. OERA, as I already alluded, is relatively small and has the entire non-independent agencies to cover right now. And it also doesn't have a history of knowing anything about the financial market. So personally, I like this idea, but I would think of it as a specialist in financial markets because I do think financial markets are distinct for a in a lot of ways from other kinds of markets. I but. would not give the Office of Financial Research any more responsibilities until they're more accountable. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, you need to, well, fair enough. You may need to adjust their accountability as well. But what I wouldn't do is give it to OIRA because I, I, I just, I think there's going to be a lack of expertise there unless you, again, beef them up and turn them into OFR. Um, so. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, sort of going back to John's question, um, you know, I, I also think that the, there is still a role for the courts. I mean, I, they, I, I know that uh, some of the enti financial entities um, who are, uh, you know, who are challenging some of the rulemakings that have had a, 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 a dilatory effect upon them um, uh, will present analyses uh, and hire people like NERA Economic Consulting to do that analysis uh, and or professors in, in, in different universities to do analyses to try to, uh, to make the case. So then, you know, the courts at least have, again, uh, an obligation to weigh the evidence that's put forward on both sides, both the uh, regulatory agency who promulgated the rule and uh, the, the, the financial entities and their own studies. So there is, there is still some value to that, uh, to that uh, challenge process, I think. I think we have about three more minutes left, so this uh, last question, sorry. Thank you, Lev Bagramian, uh, MSRB. Two questions. Um, many of these rulemaking mandates are, you know, mandated by Congress. Does Congress do its own economic analysis as it, you know, during <laughs> lawmaking process? And second question, does the academia have a responsibility to produce certain kinds of economists that you know have the public interest in mind, or could do the the kinds of analysis that uh, that you guys have agreed on. Thank you. Yeah, th there is no requirement for regulatory impact analysis of proposed legislation in Congress. <laughs> uh, the European uh, Commission, uh, European Union, incidentally, does have a requirement for impact analysis of legislation as well as regulation. Uh, but yeah, the U.S. doesn't doesn't do that kind of thing. Um, and I've I've actually got a graduate student working on a case study of one particular piece of legislation, where it's uh, this was legislation mandating uh, that railroads adopt a technology called positive train control, where it's very obvious that the process of hearings and the process of writing congressional committee reports does not produce anything that cover anything that looks like the kind of elements that are supposed to be covered in a good regulatory impact analysis. Yeah, I, I was just thinking too about the, the, you know, sort of the comment that I had, had was asked about yesterday, which was the, you know, the, uh, the slowness with which the Europeans, or I don't know if slowness is the right word, but the delay that the Europeans have sort of built into their uh, implementation of their own clearing requirement 
uh, for uh, for uh, systemic risk and and um, and you know I I guess the 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 re the sort of ex ante analysis by uh, Congress. Well, I think that uh, some level of analysis could be good. I don't know that I would advocate for the European model because that also results in uh, some uh, some slowness and delay in decision making. It, that there's got to be, I, I, and I, you know, and also the CBO, I guess, does some analysis of. Uh, I know when I was uh, acting chair of the CFTC, uh, we had a cadre of uh, of CBO uh, economists and 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 staffers over evaluating uh, some of our uh, analyses. So. Um, so there, again, I think there's got to be some ex ante ex post at the congressional level as well. Um, that would be, uh, you know, that would be nice. I think uh, the time. role of the academia. Anyone wants to? I think. Um, I'm role of academia. Uh, academics should train honest people who will do honest analysis. I, I yes, you know, <laughs> yes, I agree. I. Um, and they do. And we mostly do, yes. <laughs> and well, that's a fantastic note to uh, <laughs> our, our, uh, our our, uh, our mission at uh, Mercatus is to, to build bridges between the best of academic research and our most pressing policy problems. Um, for reasons we noted this morning, what's a bigger policy problem than our financial regulation, and you've seen us begin to build that bridge. After lunch, we're going to complete that bridge with our regulatory roundtable.